preceding program is distributed by NIT, National Instructional Television. For millions of years, the oceans have been as you see them, huge amounts of salty water pounding the shorelines and covering most of the Earth's surface. Just as we forget how long the oceans have been here, we often forget other things while taking a summer walk along the beach. We forget that the oceans are filled with many kinds of animals that have made a home there just because we do not see them does not mean they are not around us. What types of animals do you think live in these waters or grow underwater on these pilings? Ocean animals have some unusual shapes. This one is a round spiny creature that looks something like a pin cushion or a ball of spines. We call this a sea urchin. Sea urchins often live near the shorelines, and you have to be careful not to step on them. Some sea urchins have a poison inside their spines, so these could be dangerous. Reaching out beyond the spines, the sea urchin has some long, clear feet called tube feet, T-U-B-E. These have suckers on the ends of them, and they help the sea urchin to pull its way along with the help of the spines. Watch closely as the spines and tube feet work together to move this urchin. As the sea urchin crawls over the bottom, it has its mouth face down in the mud and sand. It searches for food there. To help it grind up its food, the sea urchin depends on teeth. Let's see how many teeth a sea urchin has and how these help in grinding up their food. Nearby the sea urchins, we can find starfish or sea stars. While looking at a starfish on its back, we can see that it looks something like the sea urchin. The starfish also has tube feet that stick out past its spines. The tube feet of the starfish are found in a groove on the bottom of each starfish arm, and these help the starfish to move and to eat. As these tube feet normally move, you do not see them because they're on the underside. All you see is the top of the starfish. But from the top, you can see that this starfish is made up of a center portion with five slender arms around it. But some starfish have a bigger center part with wider and shorter arms. 
just the same. On the underside of this starfish's arms, you can find the same tube feet. But how are these tube feet a little bit different from the ones we just saw? sea stars have smaller center parts and longer arms. These often break apart easily, and so they may be called brittle stars, or maybe even serpent stars, since some of these look like snakes when they move. This type of starfish has shorter tube feet instead of the large clear ones that we saw in the others. Tube feet are found in starfish, sea urchins, and even the sea cucumbers. Sea cucumbers look like the cucumbers that you buy at the market, and that's where they get their name. And just as you eat a garden cucumber, some people eat the sea cucumber. The sea cucumber's tube feet are also found in rows, and they wave about. But the sea cucumber can pull in its tube feet, while the starfish and sea urchins cannot. When its tube feet are pulled in, you can see how this animal really looks like a cucumber. Just as sea cucumbers look like garden cucumbers, sea slugs resemble garden slugs. Sea slugs are delicate, soft animals that usually hide among rocks or other objects near the shorelines. Their beautiful colors and body shape helps them to survive in a couple of ways. In some cases, it helps them to blend in with the surroundings and not be seen. The colors also probably act as a warning to animals that might eat them. If an animal ate some of the beautiful sea slugs and it got very sick, then it would probably not eat another animal that had the same bright colors. So bright colors and body shape help the sea slug to keep from being eaten. The slugs depend on large feathery stalks in the front of their bodies to tell them what's going on. These special stalks are larger than the surrounding objects, and they are where you would expect eyes to be. But a sea slug hardly has eyes at all. Their backsides are also sensitive to touch, which helps the slugs to find out what's happening as it moves about with the help of its muscular underside. Its foot, or clear underside, can hold on to objects as it crawls over the surrounding area. The finger-like objects on the slug's back are gills, G-I-L-L-S. It breathes through these thin, flattened objects just as a fish breathes with its gills. Not only do slugs depend on these objects for breathing, but sometimes they can eat jellyfish and move the jellyfish stinging cells onto these gills so that when an enemy bites a sea slug, it can get stung with the jellyfish's stinging cells. Just the same, some sea slugs do not have their bodies completely covered with gills. They may have a bare spot near the middle, like this sea slug. Or they may have their gills all bunched up at the back of their bodies, like this one. Instead of being covered with flattened, feathery gills, this slug's body is covered with yellowish to orangey spots. How could these help the sea slug to survive? You might think that it would be dangerous for a sea slug to have its gills all in one place. If something should hit this cluster, it could possibly kill the sea slug. But in some sea slugs, their gills can do something if they're touched. They can be pulled in. 
Watch. The feathery, sensitive stalks of this sea slug tell it what's going on up front, and the sensitive gills in the back simply respond to touch. They can be pulled in. So you can see that sea slugs come in a variety of shapes. Some are covered with gills. Some have clusters of gills that can respond to touch, but in general, they are soft, delicate animals with gills and sensitive feathery objects in the front parts of their bodies. When it comes to soft-bodied animals in the ocean, though, we can find much larger animals than the sea slug, creatures like the octopus, for instance. The octopus has cup-like suckers that it can hold on with. Its suckers and arms help it to grab onto its food as well as make its way over the ocean bottom. And if something bites the ends off its arms, they could be grown back. Sometimes the octopus may move very quickly and not appear to use its eight arms. The octopus can use water to jet propel it from place to place. It just squirts out water and moves very rapidly in the opposite direction. But whether it moves jet propelled or by using its arms or both, we must remember that the octopus is a shy animal. This one looks like he's trying to build up something to hide in or under. A soft animal like the octopus must hide just like the sea slugs. Many animals would like an octopus for dinner. So hiding and running are two of the octopus's ways to escape from danger. The octopus also breathes through gills like sea slugs do, but the gills are inside. It has a way of pumping water through its body to help out with the breathing. Let's watch the octopus's breathing tube in action as it pumps water out of the octopus's body. See if you can figure out how many times its breathing tube opens and closes in 10 seconds. The octopus's eyes are found high on its body. This helps it to see what's going on. And the octopus can see quite well, although it often lives in darkness. Its eyes are compared to our very own. Because of its eyes, you sometimes get the feeling that it knows you're there, especially when it rises up and occasionally looks out of the water itself. The octopus is another of the many types of animals that live in our oceans. It's another misunderstood, shy creature. But that's where we came in today, finding out that we know so little about what lives in our oceans. Maybe on our next visit to the ocean, we will look more closely and discover within these salty waters a number of fascinating animals and such.
The preceding program is distributed by NIT, National Instructional Television. Each year, thousands of birds migrate along the Atlantic coast. These birds must find food on their journeys. They must find desolate places where they can safely land. And so it is that many birds depend on the marshes and sand of places like Fisherman's Island. Fisherman's Island is located along the Atlantic Ocean at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. This is a natural place for birds to visit because plants grow here. Plants offer or attract food for the birds. Plants provide a place for birds to hide from their enemies. And plants provide a home for birds to nest and raise their young. Because people don't live here, birds have the island to themselves. They make the beaches come alive instead of people running through the sand or wall-to-wall -wall blankets. Fisherman's Island is filled with over 200 cans of birds. To see them, you only have to look closely. The skimmer is one of the birds that nest here. Skimmers get their name from the way they eat. They fly over the water and dip down to skim up fish or shrimp in their open beaks. This is their way of feeding by skimming over the water's surface. The skimmer is a close relative of the seagull. The seagull is one of the most common and important birds on Fisherman's Island. It eats garbage and sewage. Man has made so much sewage in the last few years that more and more of these birds are being seen along our coastlines. While the seagulls plot along, the sandpipers run for all they are worth to get their meal of clams and shrimp and not get splashed by ocean waves. They seem to know exactly when to run. Watch. Other birds live along the shorelines, although they may stay away from the pounding ocean. How do you think the long legs and quick movements of this bird help it to live here? What kinds of food do you think it finds among the sandy seaweed? There are many kinds of birds that live along the muddy and sandy shorelines. They may be large or small but each has carved a way of life out of the place where land meets water. Each depends on beaches or marshes in order to survive. For this reason, the marsh and shore birds of Fisherman's Island make their homes on those parts of the island. But marshes and surf do not cover the entire island. Let's go inland from the low-lying marshes to the higher sandy soil. Here, we can find shrubs, flowers, and trees. These plants are different from marsh or shoreline plants, and they provide homes and food for different types of birds. Some live in the overhead trees. If you look closely, you can find their nest. This is the home of an egret. During nesting, the young egrets may be found occasionally out of their nest, hiding and running through the dense undergrowth. 
As birds rush through thick undergrowth in and around Fisherman's Island, they often stumble into nets, nets that have been put there to catch them. These birds will not be harmed. They have been captured by bird banders. Bird banders help us study birds. They begin by taking birds out of the nets. Their special nets only tangle birds up and do not harm them. While the birds are carefully removed, some of the larger birds may bite again and again. But our young helper does not seem to mind. Once the bird has been found and taken out of the net, again a careful job of untangling the head and feet, the bird is next put into a sack that may hold several birds of the same type. From here, they may go into a holding cage, although a few birds may escape along the way. Different types of birds are put into different compartments. Our busy Audubon and bird club member, as well as other helpers, will usually fill all the holding cages and carrying sacks by late morning or early afternoon. They then carry them back to the landing where the bird bander is at work. At the landing area, the birds can be seen in their sacks and cages, and it's here that the birds will receive a band. The birds only wait for a few minutes, up to an hour or so, before they are grabbed by the bird bander. The bird bander first takes a little water and rubs the feathers on the bird's head. He then uses his special magnifying lens and looks into the bird's skull to see how old it is. He then writes down the age, sex, and type of bird and picks out the proper band size. The light metal band is carefully placed on the leg. This will not harm the bird in any way. The bird is then released. Sometimes birds resist the banding operation the more they struggle, the harder it is to band them. But the bird bander is accustomed to tough customers like this. Birds like the large blue jay may also resist. Regardless, all will wind up with a numbered band on their leg, a band that will identify that bird as long as it is alive, no matter where it goes. Its number and information have been recorded. And although some birds do not seem to want to leave, this campsite may band more than 8,000 birds, including more than 100 types in less than two months. This includes birds like the famous cuckoo that you hear connected with cuckoo clocks. But big and small, the bird banders record their details, give them a numbered band, and pass the information on to a computer that can later trace the bird's travels or how fast it grows. So the banding process does not hurt birds. It just helps us to study them. The birds are always treated carefully by experts and released safely. Let's look at some of the birds that a bird bander may see in a day's work. visit Fisherman's Island depend on berries they find on nearby bushes. These may mean food for a bird that has to spend many hours in the air, traveling perhaps thousands of miles to a winter home. They must have food. 
What if people moved onto Fisherman's Island and cut down the weeds and other plants that offer birds food? What would happen to the birds? And what if people moved onto Fisherman's Island or other islands like them? Once the Navy had a station here, their presence tells the tale of blowouts. Everywhere that men tamper with sand, and it doesn't take too much tampering, the sand blows away, leaving a hole or a blowout, as it is called. This can destroy the plants, and once the plant life has been threatened, the birds are next. By just being around man and dangerous birds, the results of man are sometimes found at the shoreline, where gulls and other birds may be sick and dying, perhaps due to oil slicks or whatever. There are so many ways that people can accidentally harm birds. We do know that birds will die from normal causes, and it's expected. But sometimes man is to blame for an early death. Sometimes. As in this young bird's case, the bird did not get enough food on its journey along the Atlantic coast. It appears healthy in every way, except that it is starving and weak. It is the lack of places like Fisherman's Island that cause birds like this to starve. We examined the bird and had to leave the area briefly. When we returned just one half an hour later, this bird was dead. With his head brutally crushed, we are not sure how it died, since some birds may attack others that are weak and dying. We did find one creature that was eating the bird, a young crab that lived in a burrow just a foot away from the victim. We watched it try and bury its huge find, perhaps to make sure that we would not interrupt its feast. And so it goes. Crabs partially depend on dead birds, and birds depend on islands and marshes in their journeys up and down the Atlantic flight paths. And of course, man depends on birds and all of the surrounding life to keep everything in balance. It's places like Fisherman's Island that help our birds to come back year after year to nest and feed. It's places like Fisherman's Island. That is so important, although they look like worthless marsh and sand, and are filled with stinging mosquitoes and flies. These places need to be protected, so that birds and other animals can continue to live their normal lifetimes. We need birds, and thanks to the United States Department of Interior, the Audubon Society, bird clubs, concerned citizens, and so many others. We have a beginning in the protection of birds and other wildlife, protection so that your children and your children's children may also see and enjoy the beauty and presence of birds, such as those that we have found on Fisherman's Island.
preceding program is distributed by NIT, National Instructional Television. There are few things more exciting than chasing a snake in your own backyard. But trying to catch a snake is not easy, even though snakes do not have legs. Snakes are designed to slip through deep grass and brush and can move very quickly. Their slender, scaly bodies help in their quick movements. The scales are especially important. Some people think that a snake's scales are slimy, but the scales are cool and dry. When the snake sticks out its tongue, some people think this means it is angry. But this is one way that a snake senses its surroundings. It tastes and smells by flicking out its forked tongue. This helps the snake to find food and this snake has detected a nearby earthworm. Watch the snake pick up an easy dinner. Let's watch the feeding process again. A snake usually strikes quickly at its victim. There may be a brief struggle where the snake takes command. But in this case, the struggle puts dirt all over the worm. So the snake develops large amounts of saliva or spit. This helps the worm to slide down the snake's throat. The snake's unhinged jaws open wider than you could ever imagine. And meanwhile, the short teeth catch the dirt as the worm enters the mouth and slides down the throat. When it's over, the snake wipes the dirt from its mouth. Some snakes have special teeth to help with feeding and a special spit called poison. The rattlesnake, for example, has these large hollow teeth called fangs. The poison is pumped through the fangs. Beware of the poisonous snakes in your area. Snakes that have fangs are very dangerous. They can kill or injure humans. You should also be careful when around the large black snake Non-poisonous snakes will bite, so avoid picking up unfamiliar snakes. You can tell the black snake is not poisonous by the double row of scales on the last part of its body. A double row of scales means an American snake is not poisonous. This also means that such a snake will just flick its tongue and move off into a brush pile when it sees you coming. This is true of black snakes and rat snakes. Like most snakes, rat snakes are very shy. They prefer to hide. Sometimes several may be together. And when they are uncovered, they usually separate and head for shelter. Other snakes, like the glass snake, spend most of their existence living under wood or in the dirt itself. 
They can crawl and push their way into the soil, keeping their bodies out of sight. Their underground movements are hardly noticeable. Yet, every so often, a farmer may dig up a glass neg by accident. When this happens, the farmer discovers something unusual. The glass snake is really not a snake at all. It is a lizard. It can blink its eyes, and while it does not have legs like other lizards, it has scales like we find in other lizards. It also has a very long tail that makes up most of its body. So the glass snake is often called a glass lizard, and it is a very shy creature that lives in the soil. A glass snake or a glass lizard doesn't look like the typical lizard. On the other hand, the iguana is very much like the regular lizard. It has legs, and in addition, the iguana, I-G-U-A-N-A, also has toenails on its feet. These help the iguana and similar lizards to dig or feed. These toenails also help them to climb trees or move through the brush. A lizard has much more than just toenails and legs. It also has sharp eyes and, of course, a long, slender tail. A lizard's tail may help with balance while it moves about, but for most lizards, the tail is not permanent. This means that a lizard can drop off its tail if an enemy grabs it. Sometimes the lost tail will quiver and jump about, allowing the lizard itself to escape. It can always grow another tail. Even the small skinks, S-K-I-N-K-S, may leave their tails behind when grabbed. And like most lizards, the skinks may also eat insects. They may simply walk up to an insect and try to gulp it down. If this does not work, they may have to use a slower process to swallow it. This is done with the lizard taking a number of small bites in such a way as to slip its jaws a little further over the insect with each bite. Soon the insect becomes a meal for the lizard. Since some lizards get some of their water from their food, lizards may be drinking and eating at the same time. Let's look a little closer at another lizard that lives near the skinks, but is often in our pet shops. That is, the chameleon. While this lizard can close its eyes like other lizards, it can also move them about as well. The eye can close, move up and down, or forward and backward. Like other lizards, the chameleon also has an ear you can see the ear as the opening behind the eye. So a lizard has sight and sound as well as other senses to help it stay away from its enemies or to find food. Let's watch this chameleon gulp down some nearby insects. If a lizard had tougher skin and larger teeth, 
It might look like an alligator, but alligators and crocodiles are not lizards, although they drag their bellies on the ground and have large flat tails. Crocodiles and alligators live near mud and water. If a crocodile is in the hot sun too long and cannot return to water, it will die. It must have water nearby. The large elevated eyes of the crocodile help the animal to see quite well. They rest high on the alligator's head and the eyes are protected by some coverings. See for yourself how the crocodiles can close and protect their eyes. So alligators and crocodiles are another type of scaly creature. You know, you often don't think of turtles as being scaly, but they do have scales on their feet and part of their shell is made up of scales. Here you can see two land turtles or tortoises. Their high or very tall rounded shell tells you that these creatures live on land. On the other hand, water or pond turtles have a flattened shell that helps with swimming. Pond turtles also have webbed flippers, and instead of eating berries, they prefer fish. A turtle does not have teeth to chew with. It uses a tough beak to crush the food and prepare it for swallowing. By eating dead fish and other similar foods, pond turtles are valuable animals. They help rid our lakes of dead creatures. But whether a turtle lives in a pond or on land, it must eventually come to the land to reproduce. And when on land, the turtle must drag its belly along the ground. As turtles are known for a shell, they are also known for a long neck. The turtle's long neck helps it to look over the surroundings without showing too much of its body. The long neck also is important because it helps them to turn back over if they are upside down. Watch and see what I mean. If a turtle does not turn over when it is upside down, it will eventually die. So the long neck helps a turtle to struggle to its feet, to struggle and survive, because survival is not easy among turtles and other scaly creatures. These creatures, though, have made their place in the world of animals and such. <laughs>
preceding program is distributed by NIT, National Instructional Television. Man has lowered many a fish hook since it was invented. He has used a large number of baits, from bread and shrimp to live earthworms. But this doesn't mean he caught the fish he was after. Man usually goes for the big fish, and far too often nothing is interested. So he thinks for a moment, and then decides to lower the bait to another depth. Perhaps he can find something there. But the only fish that seem to be in the neighborhood are small minnows, and they seem interested with other things. If only the fisherman would study the minnows that play games around his hooks, he might find that these fish are unique forms of life. While they may not eat the bait, minnows may eat mosquito larvae and the number of young insects that bother man in the summertime. Some of the freshwater minnows show us a type of animal that can be slowly changed from fresh to salt water. Few creatures can survive such changes, but most of the minnows can survive high and low temperatures and other changing conditions. When we say minnow, we are talking about a certain type of fish, actually a number of kinds of fish. These fish are small, so small, that you can usually put your hand around a large number of them. Although you should not handle fish, this could remove a protective slime layer that often covers a fish's scales, and it could hurt them in other ways. Minnows and most fish are known for their protective scales and their delicate fins that help them to swim through the water and remain upright. Minnows and other fish are also known for gulping in water. This helps them to breathe. If there is not much oxygen in the water, or if the fish is excited, it may take in more gulps than usual. This helps them to get the oxygen that is needed. Minnows that live in stagnant freshwater lakes might have more trouble getting oxygen than some of those that live in the cooler ocean waters. Where there is colder moving water, there is more oxygen with different kinds of food and different kinds of fish. Some of the fish that live in salt water occasionally become stranded in shallow pools near the shorelines. Let's see if we can find in this pool a certain saltwater fish called a croaker. A croaker gets its name from the croaking sound that it makes. It is usually found along the southern part of the Atlantic coast. While it lives in salt water, it can live in a mixture of salt and fresh water. In such a place, we can also find the catfish, or sometimes called a bullhead. A catfish usually feeds on the bottom of freshwater lakes and streams. While it does not have scales, it does have sharp bones in its fins that can hurt you. So be careful when picking up this fish. People sometimes eat catfish as well as another fish that we can find in this pool, the perch. Perch, like other fish, can live only so long out of water. A fish has been designed to live in water. Its streamlined body is one thing that tells you this. So if you are not taking the fish home for supper, be sure to return it back to where it lives. While some fish are in danger because people might catch them, the common goldfish sometimes faces danger from household animals, such as cats. While in nature, cats may sometimes hunt fish. In a house, they may prefer to at least play with them. Why?
of the cat may be nearby. Goldfish are so used to being around people and moving objects, they may continue to feed from the upper waters, although danger is nearby. When danger is near, most fish generally head for protective cover. This is true of the goldfish and the gold-colored platy, P-L-A-T-Y. These fish use plants as their way of disappearing. They just move behind them and don't move too much. Even if you find them, it would be very difficult to catch these fish. Most smaller fish either hide or try to outswim the larger animals that eat them. This is their way of survival. You can purchase these wagtail platies at your nearby aquarium shop. They are available in all sorts of colors, from blue or greenish to gold, red, black, and various combinations. While platies are popular aquarium fish, perhaps the most popular of all exotic or aquarium fish are the well-known guppies. Guppies live in a wide range of temperatures. They can eat just about any kinds of food, and they can even live in foul water. So they thrive well in a beginning aquarium. You can tell some of the male guppies by their fancy tails, their markings and colors. The male guppy spends much of its lifetime searching for a mate. The mate, or female guppy, is often larger and usually fatter than the male. Most of all, she is very plain. Several males may pursue one of these females, and while this action is going on topside, the algae eater often sits alone on the bottom. The algae eater eats small plants and bits of food. It usually rests quietly on the bottom, or it moves very quickly. While the algae eater scavenges about, the sword tails often spend their hours playfully in the upper currents. A sword tail gets its name from the male fish that has a long sword-like spike or tail. The males may come in several colors from greenish to yellow or orange. The males often bully one another and may even jump out of the aquarium, so keep a top on their aquarium. The female sword tail is known for her broad tail, and she is usually a bit heavier looking than the male. These are female sword tails. The female and male sword tails feed on a number of foods, but they prefer small plants, as does the algae eater. The same is true for our next fish, the black molly. Black mollies, M-O-L-L-I-E-S, when not feeding, will spend many of their hours in courtship with the males chasing the females. When food is around, the males suddenly quit chasing the females and all seem to begin feeding at one time. While the black mollies seem to thrash about aimlessly, there appears to be a certain dignity in our next aquarium fish, the angel. The angelfish has a flattened, thin body. It is almost like a broad leaf. And just as delicate as they appear, the angelfish are not easy fish to raise in an aquarium. They require great care and patience. They come in two basic patterns, the marble angelfish, as this one is called, and an angelfish that is more plain and ordinary. Let's watch this angelfish for a moment. What is it doing?
An angelfish lays eggs when it's time to reproduce, and so do certain other fish. A fish's egg starts off as one in up to about 3,000 or so that may be laid in a season by each female. The egg will develop for a number of weeks before the fish hatches. While it develops, it changes. It takes on a number of different and weird shapes. In the beginning stages, it hardly looks like a fish at all. It hardly looks as if it is alive. But after about two days, the fish begins to show some movement. The first movement is seen in the heart. It starts off as a simple tube that beats anywhere from 40 to 120 times a minute. Let's watch the heart change into a two-chambered heart, a heart that all fish have, and watch the blood develop in the fish's veins. and its development is complete. Its heart and veins are completely formed and move the blood through the body. The fish's eyes and mouth are formed. It will begin by eating very small animals and plants. One of the fish that begins its life as an egg is the neon tetra, T-E-T-R-A. This is a fish that glows a bit, something like a neon sign. It is very small. These may be eaten by other aquarium fish, almost any larger fish, but especially by some of the fish that are known as blind cave fish. From a distance, the blind cave fish looks like any other fish. But up close, you can see that the cave fish does not have eyes. The most it may have are small dark spots under the skin where eyes should be. But don't feel too sorry for this fish because the cave fish easily finds its way about. It has adapted to living in darkness and it has found a way of life in the water as have other fish in a world filled with animals and such. The preceding program is distributed by NIT, National Instructional Television. You have probably seen a toad in your own backyard. A toad, T-O-A-D, 
is usually a small creature that spends its days hiding and its nights hunting for food. A toad has bumps or warts on its body. Some people think that if you touch the warts on a toad, that you will get them yourself, but that's not true. The bumpy skin on a toad does other things. One thing that it does is to give off poisons that will burn the mouths of animals that try to eat the toad. Usually, the poison would not bother you. A toad's skin also soaks up water. You see, a toad drinks water through his skin and not through his mouth. That's one big reason that a toad usually stays where it's wet. Another value of the toad's bumpy skin is to help it blend in with rocks and dirt so that its enemies will not find it. When it's discovered, a toad may begin to breathe very fast. You can see it breathing by its throat moving back and forth. A toad breathes by swallowing air, and it may swallow as much as three gulps in a second. The air enters the toad's body through small openings at the tip of the nose, just as you often breathe in air through your nose. The toad's eyes are so beautiful that they have been called the jewels of the toad's head. The ears of a toad don't stick out like human ears. Instead, they are flat, thin disc that can be seen just behind the eyes along the side of the head. Just above the ears are special poison glands that make a very strong poison for this toad, so strong that sometimes this toad is called the poisonous toad. But because it's so large, it is more often called the giant toad. This is the largest toad that may be found in the entire United States. Although this toad may weigh up to five pounds, it has the common five toes on its webbed hind feet and the usual four toes on its front feet. This is the way that it is in other toads, both large and small. So this giant has a lot in common with other toads, including the common garden toad that you normally see. If you take away the warts, the giant toad also has a lot in common with its cousin, the frog. This frog is called a leopard frog because of its body markings. But all you usually see of a leopard frog are two eyes sticking up out of the grass or water. A frog's eyes are raised above the head. This allows the frog to see what's going on topside while most of its body is hidden. The frog's flat, rounded ear can be seen just behind its eye, and its ear and eye look very much like those we saw in the toad. Do you think a frog has good eyesight? A frog cannot see as well as some of its enemies, and it cannot protect itself in many ways other than hiding in cluttered places. So its trick is to keep from being seen. And if it's spotted, it often takes to its feet, jumping away as fast as it can. If it's lucky, the frog may land near a fly. Frogs love to eat flies, and they use their long, sticky tongues. See for yourself. may decide to eat and run, but usually it just eats and eats, anything from insects to earthworms. In this case, an earthworm has attracted two frogs. 
while it appears that one frog, this one, has captured the worm, it's not over yet. The earthworm is so large that one end of the worm is not in the frog's mouth. That loose end attracts the attention of the nearby frog. And before you know it, we have two frogs and just one large earthworm between them. And the tug of war begins. A frog cannot bite its food, so the two frogs don't bite off chunks. Instead, one will have to pull the worm out of the other frog's mouth. After a bit of struggling and tugging, the latecomer wins the earthworm. Or should we say, does it really win the victim? The earthworm is so large that unless it's soon swallowed, the worm may back out of the frog's mouth and escape. When it comes to large earthworms, a frog's eyes may be bigger than his stomach. So we've seen two friendly and beneficial type of animals. The large giant toad, a toad that's been shipped all over the world because it eats harmful insects. And the much smaller leopard frog that we've seen has an appetite for flies and earthworms. In comparison, in size, well, of course, the leopard frog is much smaller than the giant toad. But we can find many animals that are smaller than both of these. For example, a tree frog or toad, it goes by both names, is usually about half the size of a leopard frog. The tree frog lives in the tops of trees and it can change its color like other frogs and toads. This means it can blend in with the background, whether it be the leaves or the side of a tree. But the tree frogs or toads have a special feature that helps them to climb trees. They have suckers or a suction disc on their feet. This means they can climb up the side of a tree without any trouble at all. Because of its suckers, a tree frog can leap through the air and grab onto another branch. And if threatened, they simply take off to parts unknown. But at least once in their lifetimes, they will return to water like all frogs and toads. In the water, they will lay eggs. Frogs and toads begin their lives as eggs surrounded with a protective jelly-like coating. The young frog grows within the egg and soon begins to take shape. Eventually, it moves and struggles to leave the egg coating. Once it is free, it is called a tadpole or polywog. The tadpole has a long tail and gills in its early life. Later, it will absorb its tail, grow legs and lungs, and leave the water as a frog or toad. But some of the frog's cousins keep their fish-like tails all of their lives, and these are the salamanders. While most salamanders live in wet places on the land, this salamander does something unusual. It lives on land for two to three years and then returns to water to live out its adult life. But even as an adult, it is still very small. And it's also very shy. Salamanders, like toads and frogs, are usually very small, they're very soft, and they're very shy. In addition, they spend at least part of their lifetime in the water. But you know one thing, just like we've seen the giant toad and frogs, we know that some salamanders grow to be very large. For example, the mud puppy is such a salamander, much larger than the one we just saw. The weird mud puppy gets its name from its feeble squeaks or sounds that it makes. Since these noises are something like a dog or a puppy makes, it gets the name water dog or mud puppy. The mud puppy has some plumes or fan-like growths just behind its head. This rusty brown cluster is important to the mud puppy. These are gills, G-I-L-L-S, and the mud puppy breathes with them. Although it may swim and crawl through mud and bottom materials using its short stubby legs and 
its long, broad tail, the mud puppy will protect its gills. The gills tell us about the water the mud puppy is in. If the water is cold and fresh, the gills lie flat against the body. If the water is warm and stagnant, the gills will expand and maybe even move. Watch. salamander, but not as weird as the Congo eel, which looks more like a large eel or snake than a salamander. Its round body grows up to three feet long, and its legs are so small that they are nearly useless in pushing the animal along. But then again, they don't get in the way as the animal pushes its way through sticks and mud. The eyes of this eel-like salamander are also very small. This is important to an animal that must crawl through sharp objects and muddy waters. So the Congo eel's round and smooth body and its tiny legs and eyes help it to survive in the mud and ooze of southern freshwater swamps and ditches. This animal is also one of the few animals that will bite if you pick them up, and it can bite viciously, as you can see for yourself while watching it feed on earthworms. the Congo eel has had its fill, it moves on, and like other salamanders, frogs, and toads, it will live part, if not all, of its life in water. The preceding program is distributed by NIT, National Instructional Television.
to animals in petting zoos are covered with hair. This may include familiar looking animals or unusual creatures like the anteaters. But they are all brought here to be around people, to be handled by them, and to walk among them. You might wonder why mostly hair-covered animals are used in petting zoos, why most of these animals do not seem to mind people petting them, why they will eat from a person's hand. Animals covered with hair, or mammals, M-A-M-M-A-L-S, are considered the most intelligent of all life. They have a large, well-developed brain. Perhaps that's why they don't seem to mind people touching them. Not only are mammals smart, but they're often fast. People have long used the horse's speed and intelligence to do important things. The horse is a powerful animal, and it can easily support the weight of a rider. While the horse helps people, people in return care for the horse. They give it a steady meal of hay, oats, and other foods. Because it has a coat of hair, a horse is often groomed or brushed. After all, you comb your hair, and both people and horses are mammals. How do you think a coat of hair helps the horse? Could it keep it warm? Could it protect it from injury? What about the tough hide of the horse? How could this help the animal to survive? The horse is a mammal that often comes into contact with people. It is thought of as a friendly, intelligent animal, and they certainly do get along well with people. A little less friendly and a lot bigger is the American buffalo. The bison or buffalo is covered with a thick cover of hair, and it has hooves or enlarged toenails on its feet. Hooves help absorb the shock of the animal's feet hitting the ground. They also could provide protection for this animal, although its size and horns offer ample protection. In nature, its protection is in the herd or the other buffalo that it travels with. As a group, they combine their strengths. And a male buffalo will quickly use its strength to defend its mate and young. They have even injured people that have tried to train them. The buffalo has four stomachs, and this means it will chew and re-chew its food. When it's chewing, but hasn't taken a bite of food in a long time, it is said to be chewing its cud, just like cows chew on their cuds. Cows are close relatives of the buffalo, and they too have four stomachs. This allows them to feed on grass, something that many mammals cannot do. We depend on cattle for much of our meat, just as we depend on pigs. But while pigs don't seem to have too much hair on them, they are mammals, mammals that will eat just about anything as adults. But when they're young, Pigs and other mammals depend on the milk produced by the mother. A mother carries a natural supply of milk. This mother goat is being followed by her two kids, and they still depend on the mother for milk. When they grow up, they will eat just about anything. and their relatives are much the same as goats in what they eat and how they digest it, but they use their special lips to grab the food. So far, we have seen a number of mammals that have hooves. They stand tall, 
They often have a number of stomachs to digest their food, and they are covered with hair. Our next type of mammal is much smaller. It usually comes equipped with a large set of front teeth to chew with. The squirrels are gnawing mammals that are designed for living in and around trees. They are very quick. They can use their feet for grabbing food and holding it, or for running and climbing. They often will come directly up to a human to take food. Some people call squirrels tree rats since they look a lot like their gnawing relatives, the rats and mice. But whether it's squirrels or mice, you can find the same chisel-shaped teeth that can break open seeds. Because mice are so small, they must be careful where they eat their meals and spend their days. They have come to be very cautious animals that stay under cover most of the time. They prefer to not be seen while in nature. But because they are quick and active, they must have food. In search for food, they expose themselves to their enemies. And although they stumble onto all sorts of foods, they often must resort to grabbing just a bit of the food and taking a few bites and then taking off. Otherwise, they might stumble into the path of an enemy like the rat snake. This mouse has come too close to a rat snake. The snake seems to have seen the mouse, but will it get him? What will happen if the mouse does nothing to protect itself? After striking, the rat snake winds around the mouse and squeezes the life from it. In just a few moments, the mouse is knocked out because it can't breathe, and soon it is dead. Once the snake has killed its victim, it begins to search for a good way to swallow it. At first, it seems to try and see if it can get its mouth around the mouse, but the snake is very small compared to the mouse. Has this snake bitten off more than it can chew? Can it really swallow a mouse as big as this one? See for yourself. snake must feed on mice as its way of life, but the snake doesn't always get every mouse that it sees. If the mouse can hide, it may escape the scaly reptile. All mammals, like the mice, have enemies they must contend with. Sometimes they are reptiles like the snakes, or they may be fellow mammals like the mouse's enemy, the cat. 
mice are natural enemies of cats. But then again, cats have their enemies that happen to be mammals. What is one thing that raises the hair of a cat? Both dogs and cats are meat eaters, but they often may be seen lapping up water. This is how they drink. Along with claws and sharp teeth, the cats have a high level of intelligence to outwit their victims, which could include fish. <laughs> Typical mammals, the female cats have milk producing glands that provide food for the young. A mother cat also takes great care in protecting her young. It's a good thing, since kittens are so helpless when they are born. They must struggle to get to the mother's milk so, so that they will live and grow. Kittens are born unable to see. Their eyes will not open for about a week or so after birth. They depend on their mother for both a meal and protection from intruders. The mother also spends much of her time cleaning the young. If a person should handle the babies, she will lick them until they are free of the scent. A mother cat is much like all mammals, regardless of shape or size. She provides milk for her young. She protects them. She has special teeth to eat certain kinds of food, and she is very intelligent. This is a mammal. And so the next time you are visiting a petting zoo, take a closer look at a distinct form of life, the mammals, those animals with hair. The preceding program is distributed by NIT, National Instructional Television. These are the television stations of Oregon Public Broadcasting. is made possible by grants from the Federal Aviation Administration. Hilton Hotels, 
America's Business Address, the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, the AOPA Air Safety Foundation, the National Business Aircraft Association, Phillips Petroleum Company, and Showalter Flying Service Orlando. Tuesday morning. Welcome to AM Weather. I'm Wayne Winston. And I'm Joan Von Ahn. Well, it's a rather quiet weather picture around the 48 states early this morning. Over to this morning's national map, we find that a large high-pressure center dominates the eastern half of the country.